Hi, Chris. Hi. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? Doing well. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Uh, so for everyone who is joining, uh, today we are having a conversation with Chris Barry from Studio Tendril. He's a creative director and founder. And for those of you who haven't seen the beautiful work of Studio Tendril, let me show you some. It is beautiful motion design and graphics and all sorts of production um, beauty. So from uh, characters that are just brilliant to uh, intersection of science and 3D technologies. And these guys worked with companies like Microsoft and uh, Google and Netflix. And as you can see, it's just mesmerizing. Uh, so to kick off today's conversation, I prepared 10 quick fire questions. So um, are you ready to answer them as fast as possible? Don't think too much. They, they're very, very easy. I'll do my best. Brilliant. Okay. The last movie or series you watched? I guess it was Devs. I really got into Alex Garland's new Devs and I thought it was totally amazing. Brilliant. Uh, your favorite non-digital creative tool? Pencil, hammer, whatever that is. Definitely pencil. Uh, always, uh, I've always got my sketchbook on hand and uh, yeah, pen, pen and paper is, uh, is, a, is a definite favorite. Amazing. Your guilty pleasure? It's a long list. I, uh, I mean, the comics, bad movies a lot. Um, definitely olives. I love olives. I can eat like a whole jar. I describe <laughs> yourself in three words. I like to listen. I'm, a, I'm attentive. And um, I would aspire to be inspiring to my friends and the people around me. And I'm very, I'm very interested. I'm interested in a lot of things. I'm constantly uh, digging into uh, learning. It's my, uh, I'm, I'm into, interested in too many things. That's such a great combination of, oh, I love it. Inspiring and curious. What is the thing, one thing that annoys you the most? The thing that annoys me the most, um, probably, how little time there is in life and in every other aspect of, of life. <laughs> time I, is, yeah, I feel it's very right. annoying. Achievement you're proud the most of? Achievement, um, well, it's, it, it wouldn't be my, my personal achievement, but the studio is something that, uh, that we all as a, as a group are really proud of. It's, it's an amazing um, space that we've created for ourselves that we're really proud of, you know, that we, that we can enjoy now. Well, we definitely did a good job, but we'll talk about that a lot in a second. What is one book that changed your life? I, I guess if there was one book I'd isolate, it would probably be this book by James Gleick called Chaos. Um, and it's, uh, it's an amazing, it's amazing, it's an amazing sort of, um, really easy to read and digest meditation on uh, on chaos theory and the role of of chaos in nature and life and it's uh, but it's also a very creative force and it uh, that book really opened my mind it's something i picked up a long long time ago but for some reason it stuck with me i love it i haven't read i need to read that one what is your current side hustle or latest obsession Wow, side hustle is not my, a ton of time for side hustle, but my personally, my wife and I do a lot of projects together. She's a costume designer, and so we we like to to do these little collaborations. We'll run off, and um, she makes these amazing costumes, and I I'll, we'll set up little sets and do photography, and that's a Ooh. that's a definitely a, a side hustle passion thing. Brilliant. Uh, your favorite color. Oh, man, I don't know if I have a favorite color. That's a great question. Um, I don't know if I have a favorite color. <laughs> I, I'm prismatic. I'll go with the whole, the whole gamut, the whole spectrum. That, yeah. That's a good answer. Okay, last question. What is the best part about working in motion design? The best part is the constant uh, learning and challenges that are part of it. It's, uh, it's, um, it's an incredibly... Um, engaging and collaborative uh, world and it's a it's a global community and uh, somehow we all find each other even though we may be separated across the entire planet we somehow all gravitate and it's it's this really cool um, kind of like uh, 
Pokemon uh, motion design uh, world. And it's, it's just, it's just, it's always exciting. And we're always discovering each other and new things. And yeah. Brilliant. Oh, that's a brilliant answer. Um, and we'll go into Pokemon um, design world. That l- l- sounds like a great metaphor. So I want to dig deeper into that. But I wanted to start from the very beginning because I feel like your story is quite interesting. Um, you, you talk a lot about how you work in the intersection of science and technology and design and creativity and storytelling. And uh, as far as I know, you grew up in quite an interesting family when, where your mother worked in film and uh, your father is in science. So could you tell a bit more about your childhood growing up and when did you figure out that design would be something that will become part of your life? That's a, a great question. Um, I mean, it, it's true. I'm very lucky. My mother is a professor of film and, and in particular, Eastern European film. And so we had a, a library of films in the house, uh, like David Lynch and Fritz Lang and all kinds of uh, weird stuff that it was just on the shelf in VHS form back then. And I could just pull it off and pop it into the, you know, into the, into the VCR. And uh, that was a really cool exposure to film and writing. My, um, anytime I did anything, I shouldn't be doing. Um, I <clears throat> I had to write essays. My mom used to make me write these sort of essays, creative essays on why I did that, and so it was a really good learning exercise in writing. And uh, what my kind of uh, bad things did you do? Give me an example of something you had to uh, write an essay on. That's a good question. It was, it was, you know, I've got two sisters, so it was mostly to do with uh, sibling tensions and that kind of thing. I, I didn't get into too much trouble. I was a pretty good kid, but. Um, yeah, she's been, and my mom, uh, you know, is an amazing source of inspiration for that reason. She's, uh, you know, we, we kind of, uh, we, we get it, we can really have conversations about film and, and our love for that. And, and my, um, my dad, when I was growing up was more uh, on the microbiology end of things. And he was also teaching and he was, uh, he was teaching at the science center when I was a kid. So he spent a lot of time there at the science center in Toronto is, uh, kind of a museum of sciences. And um, he would do these lectures and I would kind of help assist him in, in um, be sort of like his, his presentation assistant uh, in, uh, back then and hang around the, the exhibits. And we used to go and, um, you know, find, go, go to High Park, a park nearby and collect microorganisms, analyze them under the microscope. I just fell in love with all of that. It's uh, still am. Yeah. Wow. That sounds yeah. amazing. And also weird but really inspiring so how, yeah how did you feel about that uh, when you were a child and again did you know that like i'll definitely go into science it sounds like something that i want to do my entire life or your mom's influence was more and you thought you'll become someone in a film industry how how what did you think back then I was really torn. I, I wanted to to pursue both uh, both avenues, and even even get, uh, when I finally got to to you know the university days, I was I was pursuing both uh, branches. I was studying the sciences and and literature and film, and I, I was trying to figure out if there was a way to put them together. There uh, for a while, I was very very uh, keen on this idea of getting into biomedical communications, which is the the art behind um, communicating ideas in the sciences. And recently I had, I had, it was a very, it was a wonderful thing. Full circle last year, I was invited to go and speak with the biomedical communications uh, group at the university here in Toronto. And it was like, it was so nice because I, I, I had always dreamed of being part of it. And, uh, and it was like, you know, that circle had completed. That was really cool. Um, but but design um, and comics and, and all of that was always in the background. And I think that really that I, I didn't really become aware of design in the, in, in, you know, in its purest, truest sense until I had the, the good fortune of stumbling into uh, Bruce Mao Design's uh, office. And, and that was like a whole education unto itself and really opened the, the door to me on, on what design meant and what it was. Uh, let's talk about this for a second, because I think that experience is something that would influence anyone. And uh, I think you, you quoted once Bruce, Ma- Bruce Mao that the problem of software is that everyone has it. Um, so yeah. it, it feels like a lot <clears throat> of what you do was influenced by your time there. Could you tell a bit more what did it feel like and what did you learn from that experience? 
Yeah, it it was uh, it was a, it was an incredible time to to be there. The uh, it was uh, it was just every day was mind blowing. It, the studio environment itself um, is is amazing. The the model of the studio that he he conceived uh, was truly a kind of um, a, a mentorship learning environment. It was a really like half the studio space was a giant library. And everybody there was uh, was from a different background. So there were there were um, really like seasoned typographers and book designers. There were engineers. There were you know, one of uh, the uh, the artist designers I worked with was a chemist who was then working on architectural projects. And it was it was just such a mix of influences and people. And they were also open and welcoming and uh, willing to share their their ideas and learning. So it was it was just. Um, it was a great, uh, a great environment to, to be exposed to many different facets of, of design and what design meant and design being, you know, a, a, every aspect of life is, is design and every aspect of that studio was, was designed, the experience of it, the way uh, ev- people interacted, the way the work was, it wasn't just about the visual side of things, it was about the entire sort of the, the mindset of, of thinking, design thinking, and systems thinking. I don't and know if I uh, how how right how now. did you get in? Did you have at that point any design <clears throat> portfolio? How did they pick you? I, I I it's like a miracle. I think I I was working at that time. I was working in a shoe store actually. I um I was I had I worked in all kinds of. I worked a, you know in a bakery. I. I actually sold Jackie Chan shoes. I sold Jackie Chan a pair of Chuck Taylors back then. This was in like 99 or 98 or something. And um, they, Bruce, now the studio was doing this thing. They were, they were advertising um, kind of like an open call in the local um, printed uh, newspaper, like Now Magazine or I, I think it was I Magazine back then in Toronto. And uh, it was it was like an open call where you could just write a, a kind of a letter or submit something that kind of expressed your, your you know, point of view or, or anything. And so I made this, le- it was like a little booklet of all the things I had. I was noodling around at home in the evenings, uh, just creating things. And I think, I don't know if I still have it. I might, this this little booklet, and I sent it out. And somehow, by some miracle, I, you know, it was... Uh, I got a call to come in and do this. It was like a freelance job uh, and it just, it clicked. I was there and, you know, the door opened and I was, but I was ready to walk through it. I think that's what happened. So there was a bit of luck involved. Uh, Do you remember your first day when obviously that's something you really wanted and there was a big surprise for you to get in? So how did you spend the first day? What were you doing? What were you feeling? Well, it was uh, it was like straight into it, really. It was uh, at the, I remember it, it was a design at that time. It was a design. It was an interesting project. It was a little design for a. It was a noodle saloon. It was like a a noodle restaurant somewhere in the states. I think maybe it was like located in Texas, and it was like a, a noodle saloon. And the the design there the the team of designers was creating the environment, designing the architecture of the space. And uh, I got just th- kind of thrown into the mix uh, to help sort of visualize and create and elaborate on the design. And uh, it was it was super collaborative, you know, and it was very trusting. I had no really no experience, but um, but luckily just enough chops to kind of like get by and make it work. And and that's a, that's kind of that was that was the first that was it. Was, but it was sort of like an informal thing in that first test. It was like a test in a way. And then, mm. uh, and then I remember, I remember the day I actually got the job, uh, and I remember, uh, yeah, it was like the best feeling I think I've ever had in my life. I remember just, yeah, just being full of, of like, you know, light and joy that that day. Amazing. Yeah. And what what did you do there? Were you doing visualization? Was it kind of ideation? What kind of projects were you involved in? It was a it was a whole gamut. Uh, at any given time, uh, Bruce Mao, of course, uh, is very deep rooted in the branding world and creating um, you know visions for brands. Uh, but also there uh, there were projects involving architecture. A lot of work with the Gary Office at that time, uh, Walt Disney Concert Hall, 
and uh, and massive change. The book was being created that, at that time too. So I, I I had the you know I was able to jump between you know doing book design one day, um, working on architecture, wayfinding and signage another day, jumping into you know ideation around branding exercises and high level thinking another day. And I was just you know a mouse sort of like skirting around, just trying to be part of everything I could be part of. Amazing. Well, yeah. I feel like uh, that becomes a thread during these conversations that we have with all the creative people that you kind of, in the moment, it seems very random, all the skills that you pick up, whether it is combination of science and design, we spoke about ballroom dancing and sports. Um, and then suddenly when you go through your career, these all pieces of puzzle come together and you realize that all these different skills and you talk about navigation design and other things, they kind of become one big, um, one, one big thing that helps you build whatever you want to build next. So if you have to think of, I suppose, one thing that you learned, whether it's from Bruce Mao himself or from your experience there, what was your biggest learning that you took away from that experience? The biggest learning was that, um, that everyone deserves a, an opportunity and that um, like really good ideas can come from any, from anybody on the team, from any voice. Yeah. Amazing. Um, yeah, I think, and I can definitely see that through the way you approach your work now and you collaborate with so many exciting people that kind of that true collaborative environment, you, you were able to, to replicate and grow it in your own company. So from kind of from that point, from Bruce Mao and you obviously were doing lots of great work, uh, how did you decide to start your own company? What, what was the, the thought behind it? And have you ever thought they will become what it is now? Well, I definitely can't take sole credit for that. That, 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 was, a, that was a tremendous uh, team effort. And of course, my, uh, my lifelong creative partner, collaborator, Alex Torres, um, it, it, was, it was us meeting that, that made all of this possible. Um, we uh, we worked together. We we met. It was odd, you know, a long time ago online. We we worked together on a short film, and he was down in Brazil at the time. This was back in uh, two thousand five or so, and uh, and this was pre everything. You know, I don't even know if um, you know we had cell phones at that time. So we were connected over ICQ. We worked on this uh, short film called Box. It's somewhere on the web, uh, hidden in the archives, and. We really hit it off. It was a it was a creative. Um, it was an instant kind of um, you know creative, and you know end up ended up becoming kind of it's like a lifelong uh, partnership. And since then, we you know we worked together for a number of years together, and and really uh, kind of got got a, a sense of each other, but also a sense of like the kind of work we wanted to do and the kind of um, projects we wanted to create and. It uh, eventually we got to a, I think, a point where we felt ready, where we felt like we could, um, where we could, uh, where we could start something uh, and give it a name and 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 start kind of like creating that like center of gravity that might attract, uh, you know, immediate friends initially, you know, those those dear friends that we wanted to work with, but also create a you know a, a place and uh, and a platform that might you know, that might create a, a like a gathering of, of designers and a place for, for more and more collaboration. Uh, that was in, in around 2009 that we made that jump. And it was a, it was a, it was a big leap of faith. We had very little to go on at that time. There were a few, a few clients uh, that, that we were working with and, um, but it was really baby steps uh, at that time. And then uh, the big, the big, uh, the thing that really enabled things to totally take off was when we met our other partners. That's Kate Bate, our incredible EP, and Patrick Coffey, who's a, like a VFX genius. And when we all came together, that, that's when the, the studio truly was, you know, founded and, and became an entity. So and that was around 2010. Amazing. And I think that's quite an yeah. interesting journey when obviously to, you and Alex wanted to build something and then you meet uh, these other collaborators that you feel you have a lot in common and but well, four people for a partnership that's a lot and uh, there are a lot of partnerships that don't survive because there are too many voices and too many people uh, involved in decisions so how first of all how did you accept 
two more partners on board when you already kind of had an idea in mind, as well as how did you make sure that four people managed to work together? It's a great question. And, you know, we're, it's our 10th year this year. It's our 10th anniversary. And I would say we've, we're just finally mastering it now. It took <laughs> us 10 years to figure that, that, the answer to that question out. You know, we, initially it was based a lot on trust and, you know, just some, some kind of sense of mutual respect for each other. Everyone does have very different and very complementary skills. So um, that really helped because everyone had, a, had their thing that they could really um, own and focus on. That's very important. So we, there was very, there, I don't think we ever felt like there was much. It was very collaborative in the sense that we weren't competing against each other. We were working together toward something that was still being defined. And that, you know, to this day still is. It's evolving every day. Uh, last year, we, um, we went through uh, an amazing visioning exercise for the studio. Uh, uh, it, we, it was uh, with a, a brand studio here in Toronto, actually, called Frontier, that do something called purpose design. And we worked together with them to take everything we'd learned up until now and really collect our, our thoughts and vision and beliefs and look forward into the future, into the next five or 10 years and try to imagine, you know, we got ourselves here, but what, what do we re where are we going with this? Where, where, what's really, what's the goal? What is the... What is it, what will make everyone happy? What is, you know, what do we really care about? And I think that going through that um, on a regular basis and having those kind of conversations and that reflection, it, um, it ensures that everybody really um, knows their sense of purpose in it. And, uh, and that keeps, a, it's a bond that, um, that lasts a long time. And yeah. you mentioned that all four of you had different roles and different parts. So could you uh, talk a bit more about who was in charge of what or how do you define the area of expertise? Yeah. Uh, and again, this always, this is something that, that does evolve over time and that constantly changes. But Alex and I are, um, you know, we've been lucky enough to be able to focus very much on the creative side of things, on the, you know, the vision of the studio, the, the creative vision of the studio, finding talent, creating the right atmosphere for artists, understanding, um, uh, you know, just the kind of work we wanted to pursue and the, the level of excellence we wanted to bring it to and really pushing that all the time. And uh, collectively, we've all been in charge of making sure that there's a healthy culture and we take care of each other and really like practice leadership and, you know, give each other feedback. Kate is deserves total credit for connecting all the dots and making, you know, it would be impossible without Kate and, and Patrick to do what we've done. And, uh, and Kate is, is the, on the business side, the mastermind. She's, she's been able to work with us and bounce things back and forth and really make things possible. Find the right partners, find the right um, channels, find the, you know, the right way for us to actually be able to do things without them just falling apart. And um, and Patrick for himself is an amazing visual effects artist. He has incredible depth of experience in that world and brings a lot of technical depth and expertise, but also has a wonderful personality. He's a dancer and he's very eloquent when he speaks. And so he, he wears many hats. You know, each of us do wear, you know, a few different hats and have a different voice. But then we, we, bring, we all bring that voice to the table together. Um, during this experience of, of, of working from home, which has been totally weird, we've all taken turns writing a weekly kind of like love letter to the staff, to the team, you know, just uh -huh. talking about what we're thinking, what's in our heads. And, um, and, even, though, um, and we, even though we're taking turns doing that, we're, we're helping each other, you know, in that, in that process. So there, there's kind of like individual voices, but there's a very coherent team thing going on there. Any advice for anyone who is starting a partnership, whether it's a two-people partnership or five-people partnership? What did you learn on, on this journey and what mistakes maybe people can avoid uh, learning from you? It's a great question. And we, you know, I, I and we have all um, always recommended that, you know, to anybody thinking about starting a studio. It's like find your partner, find your, find your dual, find that complementary other that can... Um, 
be your mirror, be your, you know, your partner and, and, and your support. And it's a marriage, you know, it really is. It's some, it's a, it's a, it's the next most significant relationship in your life next to your husband, your wife, and your children and your family, you know, it maybe in some cases can, can be different, but even, it's different, but it, 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 it's, it's a huge commitment to find, to, to be in partnership with somebody and be committed that way. So the fit has to be absolutely right. There has to be um, an instant and undeniable chemistry. There can't be any doubt in the mind that this is meant to be. Uh, it, yeah, and of course, there's work to be done, just like with any relationship. There's rocky periods, and you have to be willing to get through that and work with each other. And everyone goes through, you know, we've changed. Our, our lives have changed in 10 years dramatically, each one of us. But we've always been there for each other. And I think that, um, yeah, you, you, you're, you, you got to be in it for the long haul. And so you, you have to really like the people that you're in partnership with. You have to, you have the, one, one measure of that for us has always been, you know, will you, are, would you spend your free time with that person? Would you be, is this someone you want to go and, and spend time with just because you love being with them? That's a good barometer. That, that's the really good yeah. filter. Yeah, I agree. I think at work, you spend so much time with the people that, especially the, the ones who are running the company, because long long nights and uh, kind of difficult projects are unavoidable. So I think you have to have those partners uh, that will support you. Um, but talking about rocky periods, I'm sure there were lots of difficult situations and difficult scenarios. Could you give... Uh, maybe one example where things uh, were rough and whether it was emotional, whether it was uh, a work challenge and how did you go about it and how, how, what did you learn from the experience about having uh, these four, uh, four people together? I mean, we've had our share of rocky periods and all kinds of um, bumps in the road along the way. You know, sometimes it has to do with somebody dealing with something on a personal level. And so we've learned to empathize and be sensitive and not, uh, make any assumptions when it comes to uh, what's going on, you know, in other people's lives. That's something that's really sunk in. I think, you know, it, if there's uh, if there's tension, maybe there's 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 more to it. You know, it, it's more, it's not just always about the work. Uh, sometimes you have to dig a little deeper. You have to be sensitive and and um, and really listen. The uh, sometimes the project. Uh, fit isn't right you know we've learned uh, to be really to learn to we learned to, it took us a long time to learn to say no properly in a, mm -hmm. in, a, in and to say no in a respectful way because the fit wasn't right or that it wasn't the right um we want to we always want to bring the best we can and the chemistry has to be right with the with the people we're working with and uh and on the client side too so we really try hard to when we're vetting projects and looking at opportunities to, to, to make sure that, that um, there's a really good reason why we should be doing this project. And that, that's something we learned through making the wrong decisions in the past sometimes. And, uh, and at, at other times, it's just been process related. You know, it, again, that's something that has taken many, many years for us to figure out. We've got a healthy process now and a, a really good way of working with each other and managing the work but growing from just four people to 10 to 20 we went from being a an extremely flat organization with very little process to being structured but not overly structured that's the key for us it, there needs to be a framework and there needs to be a certain degree of of um uh role setting and I hate to say the word hierarchy. There's a little bit of that. There has to be, you know, a certain degree of um, everyone knowing where they fit into the project. But we also want to make sure that everyone really does have a voice. And so figuring that out took a long time because it was very hard to go from just everyone comfortable working in a very flat way to let's have structure that will enable us and make us better at what we do. And, uh, and that was a, a hard learning process. I mean, we, we, a lot of the struggles and things we dealt with on the project level had to do, I think, more with um, how we manage ourselves and how we take care and support each other. And, you know, if something's going sideways, how do we go and help make sure that it doesn't go too far off the rails? How can we 
always be aware of everything that's going on and make sure nobody feels like abandoned or left out or on their own at any given time. Right. And, and you raised such an important point about uh, kind of a setup of, a, of an agency, where is the balance between hierarchy and kind of flat organization. And I think there has been uh, an obs- over obsession with being flat for so long, but uh, it's an illusion that flat things can work at scale. There still needs to be structures. They might not be hierarchical, but there they needs to be structures that allow creativity um, and kind of structured chaos that um, that again helps uh, the final projects to be amazing and beautiful um so any any tip that you can give uh to someone who's going through this process of being small and flat and kind of growing into into the scale that you are um and how to organize um managers or um teams to to make sure there is this freedom but also there is some sort of hierarchy I mean, some of the the simple things that we we do are we have uh, very structured dailies. So every day, every project, it, we the studio uh, and its current form is broken out into teams, and each project has a team of between you know maybe like five to ten people on it, and each of those teams has their dailies every day. So every morning we start the day with our dailies. Every team has their own um, their own dailies, and those. In those dailies, the you know the director of the project and the creative director are sometimes present, often yes, and the producer are there to provide guidance and vision for the team, provide those rails, like you say, that structured chaos for everybody to work within. So um, at the outset of a project, when the ideas are being conceived, we try to build them in such a way that there is um, there's just enough structure there, but not too much because creative people need freedom. They need that room to explore and do their R&D. And it's so essential. Um, otherwise, the results won't, won't get pushed. They won't go beyond the, the first thing that lands on the page. So we, um, we try to, uh, to provide that kind of a, a framework, but make sure that everybody has a piece of the puzzle that they can really fully own and take charge of and explore within. And and everyone's responsible and accountable for their piece of that. So when we meet in dailies, it's all about, you know, what are you working on? What did you do yesterday? Is there anything you need? Is there anything in your way? Um, and we've got lots of tools as well, software tools. We use, um, lately we've been using Miro a lot. It's totally awesome, uh, especially during this, because the um, collaboration, as you mentioned, is a, it's a key piece of how all of this works for any um any creative shop. And when we're, when we're not together, we're really missing that. Uh, there's a lot of shorthand that's, that's missing from the equation when we're not in the studio together. So we've been working to try to reproduce that and replicate it as best we can. And that's been a very helpful tool in that regard. Um, and Slack and lots of chats. We've been doing creative catch-ups every couple of weeks to keep everyone in the loop and connected. You know, not even just the simple thing of not hearing each other's voices and uh, and being physically present has a tremendous impact on um, the culture. If we go back to to half a year or a year ago, um, how do you celebrate uh, the successes? Because I think part of also being creative and running um, a creative company is um, building this culture and building um, the the celebrations and ritual around um, creativity and inspiration. So any anything that you do, whether it is to celebrate great work or to inspire everyone or to want better teams uh, and to build that great culture in your company? We definitely, when we're in the studio together, we always have every Friday sort of um, a celebratory kind of day. We, we uh, take time uh, in, the, in the second half of the day and it's our happy hour where we can really like really get into each other's heads and discuss and enjoy and appreciate the, the kind of fruits of the week, if that, if that makes sense. Um, but we take, you know, when we launch projects, we really celebrate them. We make sure everybody feels like they partake in that, like, enjoyment of putting something out in the world that hopefully is going to inspire somebody else out there to do something. And, uh, and seeing that feedback come back about the work is really important. And, you know, when we, when we hear good things and, um, and good feedback, we try to make sure that everybody hears it. And um, I mean, we've even done award show, <laughs> not award shows, but we've done award, 
like like a sort of a in within the studio like a the leadership award the <laughs> the creativity award and we even had a big meeting and kind of um like gave these awards just to to kind of like lift people up on a on a little bit of a pedestal and and make sure everybody knows they're appreciated but it's it's also every single day there's little thank yous and little high fives and during this there've been extra i've noticed in some of the slack chats it's like you know just a kind of a like an avalanche of you know smiley faces and hearts Aww. and things like that i think everybody misses each other and yeah Aww. giving everyone congratulating each other and stuff That's good really work so now reflecting back on this 10 years and 10 years is an incredible achievement i always believe that people and companies who survive 10 years essentially they will be okay forever just because that kind of you have your ups and downs on, and all sorts of ups and downs during the 10 years and you kind of um i also believe you if you stick uh with whatever you're doing for 10 years you also will figure out the way because you just see the changes in the industry and you kind of curve your own path um throughout it so what were the key points throughout these 10 years that you felt like were uh pivotal for for you personally or for the company and for what it is now wow yeah that's a really great question pivotal moments that that were transformative for the studio i mean there were so many there have been so many I think um you know the truth is is you know we we started out it, we we kind of always had this sort of underdog spirit and we still maybe have a little bit of that under our belts because when we you know when we kicked into into gear uh they you know right away we were thrown in the mix with um trying to trying to get the kind of work we wanted to get you know and we had to start with um from the bottom from from the simplest things and and really work our way up I think some of the biggest moments for us have been um moments where we found uh, opportunities to do the kind to do the kinds of projects we we had always dreamed of doing um we uh it's a really good question I probably should think about that for a moment um I w- I think that I, you know for the first while i think our goal was that we would be like a 10 person studio and that that was kind of like the perfect size like the sweet spot and there was never really a plan to to grow to any kind of a particular size it it, it happened very organically over time and and really it's that gravity effect i be, i believe in that it's really true there's the the design sphere and i'm sure other industries are like this too like minded people somehow in the world they just find each other it just happens i don't know how it's the zeitgeist it's you know the internet makes that a lot easier now of course it's pretty easy <laughs> but um you know they i think that uh i think that we really wanted to create a sense of place with the studio tendril itself and i think that i don't know when that happened or when it became a thing but at a certain point in time it became a place um like a real place like a gathering place for 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 the local community here in Toronto of 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 designers and artists and um you know there's some amazing designers and artists here in Toronto and um we feel um like it's part of our responsibility to be um to be making sure that there's a healthy community here and making sure that uh artists from you know all walks and 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 backgrounds can have an, an opportunity to work uh inside of a studio to work with you know in in you know and if they if they are inspired and and artistic to have a place to go to to have a place to to walk in and just talk to a, to to artists there we all, we've always you know we we keep a very open door um and we 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 ask and invite people to come in and we want them to come come and and be part of our our world and visit and get a taste and see if it, if it's a a place that they may want to stay longer that they might want to learn more about and i think that you know whenever that happened whenever um it happened that tendril could be a place where um that could be like a seeding ground a place where artists can grow and then maybe learn a few things and then go off and start their own studio or their own practice or go um and spread knowledge out into the world and that that i think that that was a very um big moment for us when when maybe when that happened I, i'm not sure 
when that happened though and yeah. so you you mentioned that you thought it will be a small small city of 10 people and you created this vortex of talent and excitement and creativity so it attracted more and you you grew was it a, a hard decision did you have to make the decision of growing because i also know a lot of founders who decided against that and decided to stay small and started to reject in more and more clients and filtering their more work. Some people actually went the opposite direction and started growing very, very fast, as fast as possible and kind of, so how did that decision make um, happen and uh, what were the consequences of it as well? Yeah, that's a great question too. It's something that, um, I mean, one of the effects of um, letting things grow like naturally is that it's very easy to lose sight of the goals, the end goal, and what is the purpose and what is the, you know, the, um, the voice of the studio. And that, that has required conscious effort to like lasso all of the inspirations and diversity of the studio um, into something that feels like it has a, a coherent vision and purpose. And that's something we're constantly revisiting. And it was, at, I think I mentioned it a little, a little while ago, we, we just very recently consciously did that again, and it's uh, it's it's easy for things to become a runaway train if there isn't um, constant, you know, in um, intentional reflection over, over what what this is, why it is, and and whether it should continue. And we've definitely questioned that. You know, we've thought, you know, should why are we doing this? Why, you know, should it be should it be a tiny place? Should it be a big place? It's and then it, it turned out that it should be what it is. We need to take care of it because it, we have now our responsibility for, you know, this, this, the, the people. And also because we really want there to be a place in Toronto where that can be, um, that can give something back. You know, we, we've, we've, um, we've been so fortunate and, and, um, and gotten so much and every day is a gift from every, every one of our artists and, you know, from, the community and we just we're we want to find ways to give back what we can um and just find more um you know ways to do more meaningful work and uh and be involved in things that can um that can uh, create positive changes in here in in our in our city but but hopefully um at the very least just inspire and, and spread beauty in, into the the cosmos that that's a great mission and you're definitely doing it well because just looking at your work it is so beautiful and so inspiring that you're definitely on the right track um, and talking about talent whether you have any advice for new graduates and students who are looking to jump in the in the industry and i suppose the next question is quite linked to that as well what you're looking for when you are you are hiring talent we're always looking for a kind of like a spark alex and i call it like a, a kind of um an inner uh, spark of passion and uh, and just a little dash of talent you know they, there's got to we, we always look for just that there's like a, a sensibility that there's a bit of there's a there, there's a there's a general sensibility there and a, and a kind of a a seed of an artistic vision but but more importantly that there's like a like an inner passion that there's like a true desire to do this thing because it's it can, you know, it, it's a, it's such a commitment of energy and time. Um, it's, uh, it's all in, you know, the, 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 it's a calling. And so we look for people who have been, I guess, you know, received the call. <laughs> to try, try to listen, see if we can hear it. Yeah. Um, brilliant. Um, and, uh, and anyone who is just starting out, uh, how do they, what, what are the, what should they do to to get into the industry just um you know do your homework do your learn the basics learn the fundamentals and then and then really try to find your voice you, you have to get through all of the you know all of the um the groundwork to get to a point where finally your you know your voice can come through the noise a little bit and so you just have to be patient and it just takes time and it's a constant learning uh, endeavor. So it's very, it's very good to practice the art of learning and to have a, a, 
a, a, a way of creating space in your life that will allow you to to do that in a healthy way, of course, because you do need balance. You really do. You you know you need to be able to communicate your ideas, and you need to be social, and you need to be able to interact with people. So it is uh, it is critical to um, to balance your life to find. Um, to find your creative voice, but also to find your 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 um, openness in yourself to be able to collaborate with others and to you know hopefully set your ego aside so that you know you you don't block yourself from be- being able to um, to uh, to to take things to the next level. I love it, and I, I love the the two parts of your advice. On one hand, giving yourself space to explore who you are and experiment with your own projects but also collaborate with others. And we've heard that from, again, a lot of uh, people that we uh, talk to in the creative industry, that collaboration is something that can make you grow so much faster than anything else, especially if you collaborate with someone from a different field, like a sound artist or, or anyone else that just also wants to do something cool and you have that space to learn from each other and do something great and enjoy the process and have some fun. Um, so yeah, definitely balancing the both. Um, we have more questions about starting your own company. After about 10 years of experience, we are thinking of opening up our own studio. What would be the first step in relation to marketing that you would recommend? I suppose, how do you get the first, first clients? There, there is a really good thing you can do. And, um, you know, once, if, you, if you don't have a clear um, um, sort of elevator pitch for what what you're doing and why you're doing it that's a really good place to start it's important to be able to explain what you are and ha- and what you're doing in a very succinct and very clear way to people and to have a, a an area of focus and that can be done very simply and you know on the website in the language you use you can create a kind of a document you know uh, some people call it like a capabilities document that kind of outlines in a very very simple and clear way who you are what you're doing and why someone should be talking to you because you what you put out and how you communicate what you're looking for is exactly what's going to come back to you. And if you start taking steps in the wrong direction, then you have to backtrack and it's a lot of work. So you really need to communicate clearly, basically. And uh, language is a big part of it. And, you know, you make sure that what you're putting out to market yourself with is what you want to be doing. And if that doesn't exist in your work, then you really, you, you know, it's very, it's healthy and okay to, to invest in your own work. And we've always done passion projects at the studio and they've taken all kinds of forms from games to VR films to short films. And it, um, if that, if those are things that can help steer you in the direction you want to go, then it's totally worth the pain and investment in those things to put you in the right track. Because it not, it's not always, you know, the, the truth is, it's very hard for people to trust you to do something if there's no evidence in your portfolio that you've done it. Great. And is yeah. there any other um, additional way to promote yourself? Because you can build a beautiful website with all your work and obviously put all the description about how great you are. But how do you get the word out? How do you make Like get the word out? Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, all the platforms, the, the obvious ones are amazing. Instagram uh, is amazing. Behance is a great platform. Uh, the, uh, your website is also good. I think the, the, the truth is, is if you're creating great work and putting it out there, someone's going to find it. It's a big world and there's a huge audience of people out there and your work will find the right place. It'll find, it'll find its way to who needs it and who wants it. But it sometimes takes a little longer than we'd like. And, you know, just being patient is okay too. Things do, do take time to get out there. You know, just as an example, sometimes we'll create a a piece of work and then the fruits of that labor sometimes take six months or a year. And then all of a sudden we start to see that that's, it's gone, it's, it's, it's reached far enough out that it's coming back again. So just stick with it and don't, don't give up because it takes time. I yeah. oh, love it. Uh, definitely don't give up. I think uh, the more creativity there is in the world, the better. So please don't give up and do creative work. So how do you get those dream jobs? Uh, what is Tendril's approach to new business? New business has a few different prongs. Um, we do 
actively pursue clients that we'd like to work with um, with something like that capabilities deck that I described. So we um, contact sometimes hard to, you know, just cold call out of the blue, but, um, but we do actively, you know, constantly try to reach out at the very least putting the intention out and talking to people about what we want to do. And if you're constantly repeating those things to enough people all the time, um, you know, those, those opportunities do tend to materialize. We do have reps as well that are amazing partners. So it's uh, on the one hand, we do our own sales directly. So we go out in the world, we'll, we'll call up um, past clients or call a client to introduce us to somebody else and go there and meet and present things in person and really try to make contact, make that physically, you know, that personal connection. And, um, and then other times it's our, our repping partners like Blacklist and PSYOP down in New York or uh, Partisan in Europe. Uh, and they, uh, they can also go out with our work and share it and just spread the word. And so those are the two kind of main branches of how we, how we try to, um, to actively pursue work. Brilliant. Thank you for yeah. answering that. So we have more questions about the future. What do you think is the next big thing in the motion world? The next big thing. There's a lot of, uh, well, real-time is a big thing on our menu right now. We're really excited about the potential of real-time 3D and in particular Unreal Engine mm. and EV inside of Blender and some of the stuff that's going on over at NVIDIA. It's very, very exciting. We're excited about the possibility of taking things off of just, you know, the, the laptop and the monitor screen and bringing them into the world. So, you know, we do believe that surfaces and everything will be a screen and has the potential to be a screen in the future. And so we, we're excited about that. We've done a ton of research into the HoloLens and, and augmented reality over the years and worked in that domain. We, I think we believe that it's very likely that worlds that we can create and design objects we create will manifest themselves in, in different ways in our environments more and more in the future and become much more immersive experiences that we can interact with. Um, and real-time 3D on a practical level is going to be a, a quite a huge uh, and uh, impactful technology, just like GPU rendering was a couple of years ago. Real-time is going to have an equally amazing impact on just enabling us to work and the tools are just amazing. The next question is about the tools. Um, so is Tendril's cloth and particle work in Houdini or X particles? It's mostly been inside of Houdini. We're really, we're really in love with the, with Houdini and side effects who are a company from Toronto right here in town. So that's kind of a, and they're an amazing group of people over there of, of scientists. And, um, so Houdini is, is a tool we're really in love with. We love X particles as well and use it on projects often, but the, the bulk of, the, of the, the procedural and generative work we're doing these days is inside of Houdini. Amazing. Uh, I wanted to wrap it up with the last question to you and the piece of advice for everyone who is listening. Um, if you could imagine yourself 10 years ago and kind of we, we discussed where, where you were back then, uh, what would you tell to yourself uh, back then that would maybe help you avoid some mistakes or get you where you want to be a bit faster and less l less painful? I would say, and I, you know, I, I appreciate it now even more, but I don't know if I was as aware of it then, is just be aware of, um, of who you surround yourself with and the people you surround yourself with. Um, you want, you know, the, 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 the quality and the... Um, and of the people that are around you, they're, where they are in their journey and their creative and lives uh, is going to have a huge impact on you. And if you surround yourself with the right group of people and the right kind of, um, um, you know, people who are much further along in the areas that you really want to try to explore, then um, then you'll get where you want to be um, faster and, and in, a, in, a, in, a, in a better way and in a more exciting way. And just, yeah, surround yourself with the best people you can find, whether it's online or whether it's in a physical environment. And you'd be surprised how open people are. In, in this industry, everyone is very open um, and willing to give, but you have to sort of reach out. And um, yeah. Amazing. 
Brilliant. That's yeah. such a lovely advice. Thank you so, so much, Chris, for joining. Uh, if you're not following Studio Tendril on Instagram yet, please do. They have a lot of amazing inspiration and uh, definitely, definitely worth following. And if you're not following Futureland Academy yet, please do as well, because we have more of these interviews with incredible, inspiring creatives from all around the world. Thank you so much, Chris. Oh, thank you very much as well. It's a real honor for us as Tendril to be part of it. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.